This is lesson one training of the emergency medical responder. The emergency medical responder. First, let's talk about what is an EMR, emergency medical responder. Okay, let's give you a little overview. An EMR is a person trained in emergency care who may be called on to provide such care as a routine part of their job, whether that job is voluntary or paid. EMRs have a duty to respond to the scene of a med medical emergency and to provide emergency care to the injured or ill person. They are recognized and certified to provide emergency care to the general public until more advanced medical personnel take over. Some occupations, such as law enforcement and firefighting, require personnel to respond to and assist at the scene of an emergency. These personnel and dispatched are dispatched through an emergency number, such as 911, <clears throat> and often share common communications networks. When someone dials 911, this will contact police, fire, or EMS personnel. These are typically considered public safety personnel. However, EMRs do not necessarily work for public safety agencies. People in many occupations other than public safety are called to help in the event of an injury or sudden illness, such as athletic trainers, camp leaders, emergency management personnel, first aid station members, industrial response teams, lifeguards, uh, ski patrol members. In an emergency, these people are often required to provide the same minimum standard of care as traditional EMRs. Their duty is to assess the patient's condition and provide necessary care, make sure that any necessary additional help has been summoned, assist other medical personnel at the scene, and document their actions. <clears throat> okay. I want you guys to look at this particular scenario and think about it, okay? So you are the emergency medical responder. A terrified mother pulls her child from the bottom of a pool while a neighbor calls 911 for help. You are the first to arrive at the scene and see the neighbor trying to breathe air into the boy's limp body. The mother looks to you helplessly. So just think for a second about what you would do in this particular scenario. And when we get together and meet, I will discuss this with you and we will discuss this. So for now, just look at this, think about what you would do. And this is a topic that we're going to uh, discuss in person. Okay, so let's go over the types of EMS systems, okay? So you have the fire-based services. Fire-based services are operated directly by a local, county, or regional fire rescue department. Approximately half of all communities in the United States depend on fire departments to provide emergency services. Now let's discuss private services. Private services. These are for-profit and not for-profit companies that have been hired often on a contract basis by local governmental agencies to perform EMS services in specific geographic areas. All right, let's talk hospital-based services. These services are those that are backed up, monitored, and run by a local hospital. 
Okay, let's talk third party services. These are provided by community based EMS departments that are not a subset of a fire or police department. Many large cities employ the third service model. So let's talk other systems such as police and private systems. Other systems. These include other police and private systems that do not fit one of the models above, such as a private corporate response system servicing an industrial complex. At each of these levels, the delivery of care may be different, but the goal is always the same, to provide care according to community needs and resources. Okay, NHTSA Technical Assistance Program Assessment Standards. Okay. Working with federal partners, the National Highway Traffic Safety Admission, NHTSA, Office of EMS, advances a national vision for EMS through projects and research fosters collaboration among federal agencies involved in EMS planning, measures the health of the nation's EMS systems, and delivers the data EMS leaders need to help advance their systems. Its mission is to reduce health and disability by providing leadership and coordination to the EMS community in assessing, planning, developing, and promoting comprehensive evidence-based emergency medical services and 911 systems. In addition to NHTAS oversight of the EMS system, each state and territory has a lead EMS office of its own. These can fall under the individual state health or public safety department. In some states, the EMS office is independent. State EMS agencies are responsible for the overall planning, coordination, and regulation of the EMS system within the state, as well as licensing or certifying EMS providers. Their responsibilities may include leading statewide trauma systems, licensing and certifying EMS services, vehicles and personnel, developing and enforcing statewide protocols for EMS providers in addition to the national requirements, administering or coordinating regional EMS programs, operating or coordinating statewide communications systems, coordinating and distributing federal and state grants, and planning and coordinating disaster and mass casualty responses, as well as homeland security medical initiatives. Okay, so there's 10 components that you're looking at of the NHTA Technical Assistance Program Assessment Standards, okay? So regulation and policy. State agencies have regulations and policies in place that govern their EMS systems. The regulation and policies regarding the EMS system may vary among states. As an EMR, you are responsible for knowing and understanding the applicable regulations and policies in your state and practice. Okay, number two, resource management. To ensure that all patients are able to receive the required care, all states must have central control of EMS resources. State EMS oversight includes ensuring that EMS personnel have adequate training and providing the equipment necessary to provide emergency care throughout the state. Equipment includes vehicles for transportation, 
as well as tools and supplies necessary to provide care. Okay, um, human resources and training. All EMS personnel must be trained to adequate levels, with the basic level being that of an EMR. Each state has its own rules and regulations regarding extra training or skills. For this, the agencies have to monitor training programs, and these programs must be re-evaluated on a regular basis. Transportation. State and reliable transportation is needed for patients to reach in destinations. This includes adequate and functioning transportation services for the area, which gives all citizens equal access to emergency care. Facilities. EMS systems must have a range of appropriate receiving institutions available to meet the various and acute needs of injured or ill persons. Depending on the patient's age and condition, these can range from the hospital emergency department to spe special specialty centers such as trauma, burn, stroke, or pediatric centers. Communications. EMS systems must have a designated communications number to be used by the public to get help and by members of the emergency response team to communicate effectively. Generally, 911 is used, although there are areas that must use a non-911 or 7 or 10 digit number. Public information and education. The EMS system should offer information and education to the public on prevention of injury and illness and appropriate use of the EMS system. Medical direction, also known as medical oversight, EMS systems are required to have a physician act as medical director overseeing their operations. Trauma systems. As part of the EMS system, each state is required to have a system that ensures timely and effective direction of patients to the appropriate receiving facilities, depending on the level of care required. Evaluation. Improvement in care and assessment of the care provided are obtained through evaluation and upgrading of the EMS system, which is governed by each state. Professional Levels of EMS Certification or Licensure There are four nationally recognized levels of training for pre-hospital emergency care, including EMR, the Emergency Medical Responder. EMRs have the basic knowledge and skills um, needed to provide emergency care to people who are injured and who have become ill. They are certified to provide care until a more highly trained professional, such as an EMT, takes over. EMR is the initial training level within the EMS system. Emergency Medical Technician. EMTs have the next highest level of training. An EMT gives basic emergency medical care and transportation for critical and emergent patients who access the EMS system. EMTs are typically authorized to function after completing local and state certification requirements, formally referred to as EMT basic.
Advanced Emergency Medical Technician, AEMT. AEMTs receive more training than EMTs, which allows them to give basic and limited advanced emergency medical care and transportation for critical and emergent patients who access the EMS systems, such as insertion of IVs. The administration of a limited number of emergency medications and insertion of some advanced airway devices. This level of care used to be called used to be called EMT intermediate. Now let's discuss paramedic. Paramedics have more in-depth training than AEMTs, including more knowledge about performing physical exams. They might perform more invasive procedures than any other pre-hospital care provider. Paramedics are considered allied health professionals whose primary focus is to give advanced emergency medical care for critical and emergent patients. They may also give non-emergency community-based care based on state and local community uh, paramedicine or mobile integrated health care programs. This level of care used to be called EMT paramedic. Okay, now let's go to the responsibilities of an EMR. Ensure safety for yourself and any bystanders. Your first responsibility is to not make the situation worse by getting hurt or getting bystander or letting bystanders get hurt. By making sure the scene is safe as you approach it, you can avoid unnecessary injuries. Two, gain safe access to the patient. Carefully approach the patient unless the scene is too dangerous for you to handle without help. Electrical or chemical hazards, unsafe structures, and other dangers may make it difficult to reach the patient. Recognize when a rescue requires specially trained emergency personnel. Determine any threats to the patient's life. Check for check first for immediate life-threatening conditions and care for any you find. Next, look for other conditions that could threaten the patient's life or health if not addressed. Summon more advanced medical personnel as needed after you quickly assess the patient. Notify more advanced EMS personnel of the situation if someone has not done so already. Provide needed care for the patient, remain with the patient, and provide whatever care you can until more advanced medical personnel take over. Assist more advanced medical personnel, transfer your information about the patient, and the emergency to more advanced medical personnel. Tell them what happened, how you found a patient, any problems you found, and any care you provided. Assist them as needed with your level of training and help with care for any other patients. When possible, try to anticipate the needs of those providing care. and EMR's secondary responsibilities. Summoning additional help when needed, okay? If you're not sure, um, if you, you know, we don't practice things we're not sure about, 
you know, it's always better to summon additional help uh, when we need it. We have to be aware of that based on the scope of our training. Controlling or directing bystanders or asking them for help, okay? So you have to look at the people around you. It might not be a good time for you to grab your cell phone and call 911. You might ask someone near you. Uh, someone might have a blanket or any kind of additional resources that might be able to help you out. Take additional steps, if necessary, to protect bystanders from dangers. We run into issues like traffic control, uh, things like that. You might, you know, want to put some delineators out, uh, direct traffic, uh, you know, other things we use to uh, protect bystanders because a lot of times when uh, situations are uh, hectic, people might do some things that might put them in danger. Uh, recording what you saw, heard, and did at the scene, okay? Um, you always want to track record of things that happen. There's going to need to be reports that are written, uh, different agencies, law enforcement, uh, medical agencies, or might need to know what happened in some scenarios. And by having some evidence of what happened, that might help things out. Reassuring the patient's family or friends. Very important to be professional about the family and friends. Of course, we don't want to make promises that uh, we can't, you know, keep. We don't want to tell someone, hey, they're going to make it if we don't know. But we can be professional, courteous, and supportive, okay? Okay. Personal characteristics and professional behaviors. Maintaining a caring and professional attitude. Injured or ill people are sometimes difficult to work with. Be compassionate. Try to understand their concerns and fears. Realize that anger shown by an injured or ill person often results from fear. A lay responder who helps at the emergency may also be afraid. Try to be reassuring. Even though lay responders may not have done everything perfectly, be sure to thank them for taking action. Recognition and praise help to affirm their willingness to act. Also, be careful about what you say. Do not volunteer distressing news about the emergency to the patient or to the patient's family or friends. Controlling your fears. Try not to reveal your anxieties to the patient or bystanders. The presence of blood, vomit, unpleasant odors, or torn or burned skin is disturbing to most people. You may need to compose yourself before acting if you must, turn away for a moment and take a few deep breaths before providing care. Presenting a professional appearance, this helps ease a patient's fears and inspires confidence. Keeping your knowledge and skills up to date, involve yourself in continuing education professional reading and refresher training. Maintaining a safe and healthy lifestyle. Job stresses can adversely affect your health. As an EMR, it is important to maintain a safe and healthy lifestyle, both on and off the job. Exercise, diet, and common sense uh, safety practices can help you manage physical, mental, and emotional stress and may help you be more effective as an EMR. Okay. Okay, this is another activity that we're going to discuss in person, but I want you to look at it and be prepared to talk about this when we meet, okay? Here's the activity. 
You are called to the scene of a traffic collision in which a vehicle struck an older woman crossing the street. The driver of the vehicle is sitting on the sidewalk. The older woman is sitting in the middle of the road, crying and trembling. Her leg is bleeding and a section of bone can be seen protruding out of the skin. She has multiple bleeding wounds on the other leg and upper arms. Several lay responders have been giving care to the woman. One of the bystanders begins to scream at the driver about driving too fast and not paying attention. So just think about it for a second. If you're in that situation, there's no right or wrong answer right now. Think about how you will handle the situation and be prepared to discuss this um, with me um, after uh, you have thought about this and when we go over this material, because this is something that we have to go to, through in person, okay? Okay, let's discuss medical direction, okay? Medical direction is the process by which a physician directs the care provided by out of, uh, out of hospital providers to injured or ill people. Usually this monitoring is done by a medical director who provides oversight and assumes responsibility for the care provided. The physician also oversees training and the development of protocols, standardized procedures to be followed when providing care to injured or ill people, okay? Medical control. Since it is impossible to for the medical director to be present at every incident outside the hospital, the physician directs care through standing orders. Standing orders allow EMS personnel to provide certain types of care or treatment without speaking to the physician. This kind of medical direction is called indirect medical control. Indirect medical control or offline medical direction includes education, protocol review and quality improvement for emergency medical providers. Other procedures that are not covered by standing orders require EMRs to speak directly with the physician. This contact can be made via mobile phone, radio or telephone following local requirements. This kind of medical direction is called direct medical control um, or online medical direction to address your slides here, okay? right to practice, okay? Legislation and scope of practice. EMR must follow the state regulations that determine what they can and cannot do. Each state has very specific laws and rules governing how EMS personnel may practice in the out of hospital setting. State EMS Office Oversight. EMRs must be licensed or certified through the State EMS Office. The licensing or certifying agency um, before being allowed to work in the state. EMRs should be familiar with these laws and regulations. Typical legal concerns and issues are addressed in Chapter 3. Medical Direction. Medical direction is provided by the medical director who assumes responsibility for care provided. Right. Now we're gonna talk about 
levels of uh, credentialing, okay? There are three aspects of credentialing of EMRs, all with the goal of protecting the public. Certification, uh, certification, licensure, and local credentialing. Certification. Certification is achieved by obtaining and maintaining the national EMS certification for state certifications. I mean, for state certification taking an approved EMS course and meeting other requirements. This does not grant you the right to practice as licensure may in some states. EMS personnel generally need to recertify every two years to ensure that they maintain a high degree of competency by reaffirming their knowledge, skills, and abilities, as well as learning any new skills or information. Licensure. It, licensure is an acknowledgement that the bearer has permission to practice in the licensing state. It is the highest level of public protection, which is granted at the state level. It is generally a requirement with a few exceptions for work on federal land or in the military. States often have requirements in addition to those required for certification before they grant licensure. The state is the final authority for public protection. Therefore, states can revoke state licensure if appropriate. Local credentialing. Often, EMS providers must meet local credentialing requirements in order to maintain employment or obtain certain protocols so that they may practice. Most employers also have additional requirements as part of an orientation program that would be similar to a local credentialing process. Uh, we talk about the uh, administrative requirements. EMRs must follow any policies and procedures based on national, state, local, or employer requirements. For example, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, HIPAA, H-I-P-P-A, is national, protocols can be state or local, and specifics of uniform. Example, level of training and credentialing recognition could be employer requirements. Research. The field of emergency care and emergency medicine is constantly evolving. Quality improvement or continuous quality improvement based on research allows for continuing assessment and reassessment of all aspects of the EMS system. This includes viewing and evaluating the system internally from the personnel's and administrator's point of view. and also externally from the public's point of view. It also entails keeping personnel and equipment up to date with the latest standards of care, ensuring that personnel are adequately trained and skilled in using new knowledge. One example is the continuous evaluation of CPR procedures. As new recommendations come about and become the recognized standard through an evidence-based um, guidelines process, EMS systems across the country must ensure that employees and volunteers are up to date 
and comfortable performing new techniques. The goal of an EMS system is to provide the highest quality of care possible throughout the country, equally accessible to all citizens. Throughout, throughout research, QI programs can assess whether that goal is being met. Okay, so let's summarize um, lesson one, unit one. Let's put it all together, okay? Since the EMS system was established in the United States, it has undergone significant changes as it has grown and adapted to citizens' needs. However, this growth needs to continue as the field of emergency and pre-hospital care continues to evolve. The primary role of an EMR is to provide emergency care at the scene. While working with other services and healthcare personnel, it is important to understand that the role of the EMR does not stop at providing care. EMRs must continue to grow and learn along with the field. They must remain certified and retain their licensure in order to practice in their chosen state and, as such, must maintain the necessary standards as outlined by that state. To be an effective EMR, you must not only be able to keep up the professional side of your work, but your personal side. EMRs have a responsibility to remain fit and healthy in order to perform their duties accordingly. This means maintaining a healthy lifestyle and being aware of your choices and how they would and could affect your performance at the job. The size and scope of the EMS system in each state may vary according to population needs and resources. However, all systems have some things in common, namely their need for certification and licensure and their goal of providing equal access to pre-hospital care to all citizens. Oops, all right, 13, okay. So you are the emergency medical responder. Now, this is another um, scenario that we are going to have to discuss in person, okay? So I just wanna go over this with you and we will discuss this in person. A terrified mother pulls her child from the bottom of a pool while a neighbor calls 911 for help. You are the first to arrive at the scene and see the neighbor trying to breathe air into the boy's limp body. The mother looks at you helplessly. So take some time and think about how you respond to this, what your instincts would have you do, um, what you think uh, might need to be done, um, you know, before you can assist in however you see fit. So I'll leave you off this chapter. Just take some time to think about this and we will discuss this uh, when we meet.